Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a family portrait on a legendary house. And if you've been following my channel, you know that I've done family portraits on about 10 or so houses that I've already ranked. So this is going to be a ranked family portrait on the precious house of Givenchy, which I think is extremely underrated. Uh, I think that Hubert Givenchy created uh, one of the greatest fashion and houses for, for uh, perfume of all time. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the history and how it came about. Um, and so if you've been watching my, um, my channel, you know that I have been away for a little bit. So I have to say that I'm absolutely stoked to be back because I was away for about a week and I'm still recovering from that trip. Uh, I've, been, I've been trying to catch up on my sleep. There was a lot of work involved. It was a work slash play trip. I went to New Orleans and uh, Jazz Fest was going on. There was a lot going on in the city. Um, and so sometimes, you know, with my job, there will be some travel involved where I'll be away. But um, sometimes I can do videos like I did from Houston that one time where I went to that local perfume shop, uh, Perfume Planet, I believe it was called, and did an unboxing video of some local things that I found there. And sometimes like this last week, I just won't be able to, to, get, to get around to it. I won't have time. Um, but it is an extremely exciting time for me personally and, and really for frag heads in general. Arige Ladore, one of my absolute favorite houses nowadays, it's really um, taught so many of us what real ingredients feel like and smell like, what real oud is, what real musk is, what real ambergris is. And I think Russian Adam has sort of built up this, um, he's sort of built up this reputation for himself. And if you're watching this long after the fact, I do apologize, but, uh, I have to kind of open by saying that this Friday on May 5th, according to DHL, as long as DHL is correct, I will be receiving my History of Oud collection. And uh, I absolutely cannot wait to kind of unbox it with everybody. I'll do an unboxing video and then we'll do a live stream Friday night uh, where we kind of talk about each one. And then to put the icing on the cake at some point, hopefully in the next week or two, Russian Adam's going to join for a, another interview. And I believe this will be our fourth one. He's already been on the channel, I think, three times uh, already. And so I think this is the fourth one. I'll have to check. But uh, he's become a regular guest, but it's been a while since we've had him on, so I absolutely cannot wait to have him on to talk about this History of Oud collection. You know, he's sort of uh, built up this reputation for himself, and I think uh, this History of Oud collection is all of a sudden so sought after, you know, his name is almost synonymous with Oud. When I think of real Oud, not the crap that the, um, you know, the Tom Fords and the Dior's of the world are force-feeding us, where they make 3,000, you know, percent markups, but, um, you know, the, the real Oud, the uh, artisanal Oud houses, if you will, the Ensars, the Arige Ladores, the Bortnikovs of the world, um, which speaking of Bortnikov, I'm still sobbing a little bit inside from um, this happening yesterday. I had a unboxing video uh, and this arrived broken. This is Sir Winston. So I'm still on the hunt for Sir Winston. I thought I had it sorted and it, it the, the head basically came off. Um, so rest in peace, Sir Winston. But uh, these are the type of houses that I've been really interested in, in lately. And so if you follow the channel, Friday, May 5th, we will have a live stream about the new Arige Ladore History of Oud collection. Cannot wait. Absolutely cannot wait. So stoked. Uh, but I love doing videos like this where we just kind of give an excuse to talk about a lot of fragrances at once. And that's exactly what this video is going to be. It's going to be a top 10 on the, on the House of Givenchy. And um, the reason that I haven't done this yet is that I didn't have 10 fragrances even, and I didn't want to do a top five or anything like that. So I've kind of been holding off. And then I have to give a shout out to one of the brothers in the community, Joy Amin. He actually did a video on this and it reminded me that, you know what? I've never done a um, family portrait on the house of Givenchy. So this is my rank list. My list and his list are going to be extremely different because obviously I have a taste for the vintage flair. Uh, if you know me, and if you've watched my top 100 countdown that I did whenever I uh, hit a thousand subscribers for the first time, um, you'll know exactly which one's number one. There is no surprises there. But maybe the rest of the list might surprise you a little bit. Um, so this is going to be a top 10 of my favorite Givenchy fragrances ranked in order of my favorites to wear, okay? So I'm not saying number one is better than number 10. I'm not saying number two is better than number nine or anything like that. Uh, all of these on the list are actually fantastic fragrances. I think the House of Givenchy is very underrated 
Although one thing you will notice, there's none of the new offerings that come out. Uh, so when you go to the house of Givenchy and you look around at some of the stuff that they do, you'll notice that you're going to see a lot of Givenchy gentlemen, you know, reserve and privé and all this stuff, uh, intense and absolute. I'm not, I, I don't, I have not gotten interested in any of those. None of them. They're not my taste at all. Uh, I would much rather go after the vintage stuff. That's just my taste. Um, and so that's exactly what you're going to find here. You're going to find a big slant towards my personal taste, which is going to be um, the vintage. So the vintage bottles. So I want to read you a little blurb, an interesting fact, if you will, about the house of Givenchy, and then we'll sort of hop right into it. So Hubert de Givenchy, the founder of the brand, which has been in existence since 1952, came from a wealthy family. He therefore grew up in an environment that could take time for the beautiful things in life and absorbed the sense of aesthetics from an early age. Hubert de Givenchy has since retired and sold his company to LVMH. One of his successors as creative head at Givenchy was John Gal Galliano, who also had a stint at Dior. His muse was Audrey Hepburn. Everyone knows the little black dress she wore in Breakfast at Tiffany's. Further development of the classic invented by Coco Chanel. The great Hollywood stars adored their creations, which gave dignity and grace to each wearer. The, this impression is also conveyed by the noble fragrances of the brand. His first work was called Le Interdit and was another tribute to his muse. The successors to his first perfume, such as Pie or organza are in no way inferior to it in class and quality. Okay, so they probably could have done a better write-up um, on the house, in my opinion, according to uh, to Parfumo, but uh, we'll we'll give that we'll give it a, a pass here. So let's do scent of the day, and then we'll hop right into this list. So my scent of the day, actually, I have to give a special shout out to Galen, uh, the etherealist. He sent me a very generous decant. And I figured, you know what, I'm gonna wear this to work today, and I wore it to work and I absolutely loved every second of it. I think it's one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite vanilla fragrances of all time. If you are not a vanilla fan, I would still urge you to try this if you get a chance. I'm probably shooting myself in the foot because this is actually one of my unicorn bottles, maybe my number one unicorn bottle. If I could maybe secure one bottle that is rare, discontinued, lost, hard to find, this might be it. Uh, and interestingly enough, though, I put my decant on my left hand and I put Galen's decant on my right hand. I've just been sort of putzing around with it, playing with it today, sort of smelling the differences. And there are differences. Um, the uh, fragrance is Guerlain's Metallica. And Metallica came out in the year 2000, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, the year 2000. They actually had to change the name to Metalis because the brand... The band Metallica sued the brand of Guerlain, uh, and so they had to change the name, but the name is still perfect. But the difference is, though, I'll tell you, in Galen's Decant, there's a much more animal, there's something a little bit uh, dirty underneath, almost like there's a little bit of this castorium, or not castorium, but a little bit of this ambergris-like uh, tincture in the base that shouts a little bit more in the beginning of the fragrance when you first spray it's almost like some of that base ambergris is like seeping its way up to the top and it just sort of tickles your nose a little bit like you get this um animalic feel something a little bit uh rancid underneath whereas my decant that i have which i got from mudasir and this is much more sort of traditionally guerlain uh ambery um vanillic you know it, it really goes into beautiful just you know flowing billowing orris root is what it feels like to me this carnation and rose and ylang ylang beautiful flat beautiful floral heart uh and it is a little bit powdery but um i don't get that animalic i don't get that hit of this animalic ambergris as uh as strong as i do in in the decant that galen sent me there's no doubt it's definitely Metallica, but it's just interesting how the different bottles sort of play off of each other. And it's interesting to me also because, you know, sometimes as perfume lovers, there's so many things to discover and so many things to get to know and get your nose on. Sometimes we'll spray something and make a judgment. Oh, this is shit. This is good. This is bad. This is great. This is a legend. This is terrible. Who, who the hell would ever wear this? And it's interesting, though, that I get these different facets from different 
um, decants. And, you know, sometimes that's how it goes with these older fragrances too, depending on how it's stored, depending on uh, which batch you got, whether you got one of the early 2000 bottles, whether you got one that was done in 2004, 5, 6, you know, there's different versions. Um, sometimes reformulations happen. And so it's just something that I've been thinking about today. You know, like if I smelled this, would I love it as much as the one that I had? And I don't even know which one I love more because they're both, they're both, um, you know, they give off different facets. You can explore different parts of the perfume almost. So I've definitely enjoyed wearing it today as my scent of the day. But um, this experience today, I think, has really taught me to maybe try to take my time a little bit, try to be a little bit more patient before you can just make kind of a split, split second decision. Sometimes split second decisions have to be made, especially when we're doing like early impression or the, you know, the late night insight videos where I only have a couple drops and that's it. It's the only time I'll be able to do a video on it. Obviously, you have to kind of make a split second decision, but if you have the juice, Sometimes you really have to kind of spend time with something and live in it um, and get to know it before you can sort of write it off or, or say that you love it. Okay, so let's do this top 10 Givenchy. And um, number 10, it was actually tough for me to put this here because I do think that this is a very good fragrance. It was done by two master perfumers, all-star perfumers, Alberto Marias and Ilias Ermendis. Ilias Ermenidis, excuse me. Um, and, uh, I really like Ilias's work, by the way. He's a very unsung perfumer, but they created this in the year 2002, and this is called Givenchy Pour Homme. So this is number 10 for me, and the reason it's number 10, actually, I might spray these because it's been a while. Um, some of the ones that I haven't smelled in a while, maybe I want to spray them. Let's see here. Let me grab some of these. Let's grab some blotters, shall we? Okay, I'm going to make a note here. Givenchy's Pour Homme. Let's spray. So, uh, the reason that this is number 10 for me is that this has this very designer sort of, um, I would say, citrusy, uh, woody smell, okay? So you're going to get a lot of this cedar-like note. You're going to get a lot of um, traditional lavender and some very uh, professional vetiver. I was actually thinking about doing a This Is Not A Top 10 Best Fragrances For Work video, and I'm, I still very well may do that one day, but I need some more time to plan. This is a perfect work scent. I mean, it's a... It's not that it's nondescript, but it smells... Um, even if you've never smelled it before, it has this familiar smell, if that makes sense. It smells like some of these woodier elements you've smelled before, these sort of fresher, spicy, woody. Um, it's not necessarily boring, but maybe if you've smelled hundreds, thousands of perfumes, you'll get to the point where this DNA might just make you shrug a little bit. You might just go, eh, you know, it does the job. And actually, it does it really well. And I enjoy wearing it. I like it. Uh, I think it's a, for people that like designer scents, if you're someone who, you know, your favorite fragrances aren't from, um, you know, they, they're not from Roja Dove and Zerjoff, or they're not from Ensar or Arige La Dore. If you're someone that likes, you know, stuff like uh, Dior Homme or Guerlain's Lidge, or, you know, you like the more mainstream sense, if you will. This could be right up your alley. This is a, um, there's this familiarity, there's this comfort to it. Um, you know, this is something that I would probably think that the average person on the street who's not addicted to, to cologne and perfume like we are would smell this and go, yes, absolutely, that's nice. It's very wearable. Um, there is something, though, once you've smelled a lot of fragrances, you start to kind of pick out these uh, more generic uses of synthetics that just sort of give off this, um, you know, this to me gives off this very turn of the century, er, you know, easy to wear sort of masculine smell, if you will. And that's why this is at number 10. I still think this is a great fragrance. Uh, I think they did a great job with this one. I'm glad to have it. I actually have a little bit of an older version. I don't know if I'll be able to just show you by the uh, bottom of the bottle. 
I might have to show you the box to really see the difference between this and the uh, 2J01, I think is the batch code on this one. But uh, the box that this one came in is actually an older style box compared to the to the new box. So if you pull them up, you'll be able to see the new box. This is the older style box. Not that that means anything, but um, just something that I kind of noticed as I was buying it. It's the 100 mil. So yeah, I mean, fresh, spicy, a little bit of labdanum in the base to add some heft. Labdanum sometimes um, gives off this sort of sticky resin. If you ever held labdanum, uh, used to be able to buy it on Amazon, interestingly enough. And, and somehow I acquired some back in the day and I wish I would have kept it. I have no clue where it went or it probably got tossed. But, um, you know, whenever you opened it up, if it got on your fingers at all, it was like, it was almost like um, super glue. I mean, it was so, it would just stick to your fingers. And uh, I think the scent is complex enough that labdanum could actually be a perfume in and of itself. And so the fact there's a little bit of labdanum in there with the cedar in the base, slight little hints of you know, leathery, resinous feel, woody resinous underneath. I like this. I like it, but I don't love it because I think this would make a great fragrance for somebody just sort of starting their journey. You know, maybe when I talk about some of these vintages to somebody who's newer watching this video, you might kind of cringe and think you're just not ready to go all the way back to 1974 yet. Um, this is the fragrance for you to, to check out. You know, it opens up with grapefruit and mandarin, very citrusy and, and some coriander which is the uh, seeds of the cilantro plant. Coriander is, is the seeds of cilantro. And it's just, um, it's just a well-made designer. I don't think anyone's, I don't think anyone's gonna see this as like a hype beast on YouTube, but it's definitely one to, to keep on your radar if you're, if you're interested in this kind of thing. So that's Givenchy's Pour Homme at number 10. Number nine, uh, number nine is uh, a discontinued vintage fragrance that turned into a little bit of a unicorn, and then all of a sudden it started popping up at some of the discounters lately. I think, don't quote me on it, but I think that fragrancebuy.ca um, has, excuse me, has bottles of this for a very cheap price, like 50 or 60 bucks. Um, and these were going for hundreds on eBay, if you take a look, uh, before, before they kind of popped up again at discounters. Sometimes that'll happen. Someone finds like an old batch in a warehouse or something like that, or um, you know, someone that's been sitting on a lot of bottles sells a, a big chunk to the, to the, um, to the aftermarket discounters like Fragrance Buy, and all of a sudden they pop up again and then they disappear. Uh, but this is called Ensense. This is Givenchy's Ensense. And this actually came out in 1993. So it came out right before, this is kind of an interesting time because it's after the 80s. Um, but it's before sort of that aqua de jo wave, like just a year or two before that wave of aquatics kind of came along and washed everything away. So Parfumo lists this as a floral green fragrance, okay? And there are some fruity notes as well. You're going to get some black currant. You'll get a little bit of green basil. You'll get mandarin orange. But for me, this is a, what I would call a masculine floral, okay? This is a masculine floral fragrance is how it was marketed when it came out. And I think this was a gigantic flop. I don't think this sold as well as I thought it would. Um, and it's been discontinued forever. Uh, Danielle Moliere is the perfumer. And the, the heart of this is sort of the, to me, the um, majority of the fragrance. It's Lily of the Valley, Magnolia, Mastic, and Iris with a base of fir balsam, according to Parfumo. And um, the reason that this is at number nine is, well, number one, this is not my favorite style of fragrances, but number two, I really think this suffers from, uh, in, in my mind anyway, as almost like, um, you know, sometimes I almost think of myself as like a fragrance detective or a historian. I like to go back and really explore things from the past and make comparisons and make connections. And as soon as I smelled this, it reminded me of a fragrance I already had in my collection. And this one is actually thanks to Anuj. He found this bottle for me. And this is called Nino Cerruti's Porom. And this came out in the late 70s. And I think that this, in 1993, is actually very heavily influenced by what Nino Cerruti did in the 19, late 1970s. And if you've ever smelled Nino Cerruti Porom, 
they definitely have um, some similarities. However, I think that uh, Nino Ceruti Pour Homme is the superior fragrance hands down. I'd take it 10 times out of 10 and um, came out in 1979. Uh, it's got a little bit more of this sort of minty, sprightly, fresh opening. And But what it does is it adds more of the vintage masculine notes from the past. So you get things like stone pine in here. You get thyme. Uh, you get um, oak moss, big slug of oak moss in the base with fur. And kind of this vintage muskiness. And for me, this is, this is kind of the perfected version. And this is almost like the remix that didn't go as well. I still like it. I still think it's a good fragrance and they are different. I'm not saying they're exactly the same, but I would put them in the same category for me. And, um, you know, it's just interesting. You think how much time has passed from 1979 and then Givenchy tries to kind of whip out this style in 1993 and re reinvigorate it, revitalize it. Uh, and I don't think it did that well. I just think there were too many other bigger forces pulling at what people wanted to wear in 1993. This actually did spawn a flanker though, believe it or not. I think there's one called Ensense Ultramarine and they have changed the bottle. This is what the original vintage version looks like. Uh, they have since actually changed the bottle and so even though it's uh, discontinued, you, you could see a newer bottle that looks more like the modern... Um, uh, I don't know what Givenchy calls it, Gentleman Collection or something. It's it's the same bottle that Zarius comes in, which uh, we, we will get to very soon. Okay, so Ensense comes in at number nine. Number eight. Number eight is going to be uh, a fragrance from 1959. It's actually the very first, I think it's the first, uh, masculine fragrance by Givenchy. Vetiver may have came first, which I actually don't have. It's on my list, I think. Vetiver's, uh, Givenchy's Vetiver was uh, Hubert Givenchy's signature scent, from what I heard. I heard that's what he used to wear, is, is his Vetiver. But um, this one came out in 1959, and so you might be surprised this is so low, but worry not. There is a flanker to this, which is way high on the list. And this is from Francis Fabron created this, and this is called Monsieur de Givenchy. Now, I just got this uh, probably within the last couple months, thanks to my good friend Cullen, uh, who secured me this uh, this older vintage bottle. And I got to know it. I've worn it to bed a couple times, but I'm no master. Uh, I have not mastered this fragrance by any stretch. But basically, this fragrance to me, if you want to think about anything, think about something like Monsieur de Givenchy sort of influencing what came about six or seven years later, which is this, Dior Sauvage, Eau Sauvage, excuse me, Dior's Eau Sauvage, which many consider one of the greatest masculine fragrances of all time. I am not one of those people, but many of the people in the know, many of the experts consider this one of the greatest masculines of all time. It was done by one of the greatest perfumers of all time, Edmund Runitzka, and I think after just sort of getting to know Monsieur de Givenchy, I really do think that this was sort of the inspiration or one of the things that was sort of swirling around Edmund Rudnitska's head as he was creating Eau Sauvage because there is this um, undeniable sort of lemony, citrusy, um, peppery sort of opening, this fresh citrusy opening. There's some lemon vervain, which you will also find, by the way. There's some lemon vervain in um, Eau Sauvage. And there is lavender in here. It's unmistakable. You're going to get the lavender. And again, you're going to get some lavender in Eau Sauvage with um, oak moss, musk, and sandalwood. And this fragrance, the reason that it's not higher is because it just doesn't fulfill that um, desire for more. You know, one thing that you've heard Russian Adam and I talk about in our interviews, if you've never watched my Russian Adam interviews, I would highly encourage you to go check those out. They're under the interview playlist because we're going to have another one hopefully here in the next week or two. Um, but one thing we talk about is how we almost have this like disease where we always want more. We want more of the, you know, heavier notes, more oud, more musk, more ambergris, you know, that kind of thing. And this doesn't deliver that. However, however, um, the reason this beats out uh, Givenchy Pour Homme and Ensense in my mind is that this has this very classy... Uh, well-made vintage vibe to it 
and you will get some of the old school oak moss in the base. It has this texture to it, but it just seems a little bit fleeting. You know, it has this, um, um, I've never smelled Armani's, uh, Porom, O Porom, whatever they call it, the um, the original Armani for men, which which was very popular, I believe, back in the um, 80s as well. I've never smelled that one, but I imagine that it's sort of in a similar vibe as this as well. So you can kind of see where I'm going with this. Uh, Chanel's Pour Monsieur, that kind of thing. We're in that ballpark, if you will. And so while this is good, it just doesn't scratch my itch for that for that more, although there is a flanker of this, which we'll talk about here very soon, that's much higher on the list. So at number um, eight, we've got Monsieur Givenchy from 1959. Okay, 1970, we're actually flipping to the first woman's fragrance on the list, and there's another one coming up soon as well. And so at number seven, uh, at number seven, we have Givenchy three. And again, I can thank Anuj for finding this vintage bottle for me. This is an older tester that he had. You can kind of see the note listing right there on the back. And this is a what they call a green sheepra, and it's spot on. This is a green floral sheepra created by Jean-Francois Laty and Raymond Chailin, two of the, you know, again, classic all-star perf perfumes from uh, IFF. They work for International Flavors and Fragrances. And this is galbanum, aldehydes, gardenia, bergamot, and peach with carnation, iris, jasmine, lily of the valley, narcissus, and rose, with a base of oak moss, patchouli, myrrh, ambergris, castorium, and vetiver. So if you like big floral sheepras, if the stuff that Roja Dove makes, those old school vintage sheepras from the past kind of really turns you on, if you like uh, very complex fragrances that have a lot of transitions and they change while you wear them on your skin, uh, this is definitely a fragrance to check out. Now, one thing I will say, this is the 1970 version. They re-put this out sometime in the 2000s, 2007, I want to say, or uh, 2017, I can't remember, but this was reissued at some point. Um, and so this version is discontinued. I think the new, the newer version, which is they're even calling it a completely different version, is still available, but I've never smelled that one and I have no idea what it's like. But I will say this, uh, as soon as I smelled this, there was a fragrance again that I will just mention from the past that kind of jumped into my head. And that fragrance is called YSL's Y from 1964. So this came out uh, six years or so before Givenchy number three. And YSL Y is the very first fragrance from the house of YSL. Uh, it's marketed towards women, but it... It has this um, unbelievable honeysuckle note that um, I think is one of the best in the game. It's got honeysuckles, it's got fruits, it's got green touches, and it's got this unbelievable floral heart. I mean, this is not the kind of stuff that I want to wear to the office or anything like that. Very rarely do I get the urge to wear these type of fragrances like out and about. Uh, although I am wearing a women's fragrance today, like I said, with uh, Guerlain's Metallica. But a lot of times I like to stick to my masculines, vintage masculines and niche and, and stuff like that. Uh, but I will wear these to bed. And I'll tell you what, as far as like being a, you know, um, as far as being Sherlock Holmes of the fragrance, you know, game and trying to figure out all of the little details and smell it on your skin one day and then smell it again and see if you can pick out changes and how it changes over the hours and all that stuff. Um, these type of fragrances are priceless. I mean, uh, the niche houses nowadays, I, I think they have no chance, no chance to recreate this type of perfumery. It is dead. It is, it is truly dead. And these type of fragrances are invaluable for studying kind of what came before. And I've said it many a times, but if you want to kind of know where we're going in the fragrance game, or if you want to know how we got here, you have to study the past and do not overlook these, um, these feminine targeted fragrances if you are a guy. So this is discontinued. This is discontinued, but they both kind of fall into the same category. This is a floral sheepra with, um, like I said, a beautiful floral heart and oak moss. And, and this is a little bit more, it has a little more of these sort of um, heavier, excuse me, base elements. You get Styrax and Benzoin and Civet in here. Um, so Civet, 
instead of um, instead of castorium. So they kind of go in slightly different directions, but I can totally see the um, I can totally see the influence that YSL's Y from 1964 sort of um, you know imparted on Givenchy three. And then if you've smelled some of those 70s green fragrances, if you're a fan of things like Chanel's number 19, one of the greatest green fragrances of all time. If you're a fan of, um, let's say, Estee Lauder's Private Collection, which I have hyped on this channel before, I have the Pure the pure Fragrance Spray, they called it, which that's discontinued, um, but one of the greatest green fragrances, you know, of the 1970s. This, I would say, you could put right up there, right up there with those giants, you know. One thing that this has that YSL's Y does not have is this myrrh. Myrrh, real ambergris, castorium in the base. I mean, if you're a fan of um, of of Shepras that are complex and the materials in this are out of this world. I mean, if if you if you have gotten your nose on a lot of niche fragrances today, and you think that um, you know because you've smelled some Roja Dove that you know what the best materials in the world are, you have to smell some of these vintages. I mean, um, you'll I think you'll be you'll be pleasantly surprised as I was, pleasantly surprised. But you have to trust your nose. You know, you have to go with what you love. So for me, I mean, I probably shouldn't have a full bottle of stuff like this because no way am I going to go through it. But I use it as like a museum piece. Like I use it as a reference when I want to kind of get to know something. Actually, I'm going to spray it just because it's been a while. I'm going to spray Givenchy's three. I don't need to spray. I do not need to spray the other two, but this one I want to spray. It's been a while since I've had a chance to smell this. I'm going to let that settle while we go to the next one. Okay, so that was number seven on the list. Oh, God. Oh, maybe I should wear more of this. Unbelievable. Man, that galbanum in the opening. There's a little bit of Misty Ore in here, too. Just a little bit of Misty Ore, by the way. That's something I should mention as well. Um, Speaking of all-time great green fragrances, there's a little bit of this uh, Misty Ore. Oh, you know, there's also a little bit of this, um, almost just a touch of this sort of... A little bit of this, um, you know, stale cigarette vibe, which Chanel used again in things like Cristal later on and stuff like that, but... Man, if you're a Sheeper lover, I'm telling you. And that's why this is so hard to, to rank. It's so hard to rank these because this is pure personal preference. I could easily, easily see someone coming in and saying, this is the best Givenchy fragrance of all time, hands down. Um, and I couldn't argue with that. I mean, the quality of the materials in this are out of this world. It's um, unbelievable. Okay, so that was number seven. Number six, and again, this is personal preference on how I like to wear them, but um, this is actually a little opposite of um, Givenchy number three. This is a masculine targeted fragrance from the 90s that was competing with the aquatics. But let's say you were somebody um, and you didn't want to follow the, the crowd. You didn't want to wear Aqua de Jo, right? You didn't want to wear the um, salty, seaside, fresh, aquatic fragrances. You wanted something different. You wanted something spicy and woody, but still modern. This was your answer. This is what people wore uh, in the mid-90s. And some people call this synthetic. That's the biggest knock on this, is that it's synthetic. But they say that with a lot of Anique Minardo's work, and I completely disagree. Uh, I mean, I understand what they're saying, but I, I disagree. I have no problem wearing this. It doesn't bother me at all. Uh, and I think it's a fantastic fragrance. At number six, we have Zarius Rouge. And Zarius Rouge, this is the vintage bottle. They've then now repackaged it in sort of the generic, whatever that generic Givenchy bottle they're using now is. I hate that LVMH does that, by the way. Um, and so this is a fragrance that has a very unique note. There's a note in here. I don't think I've accompanied it, maybe except for like one or two other fragrances. One of those notes is kumquat. There is a kumquat note in here. And one of them is a note of green cactus. 
Yes, there's a green cactus note in here uh, in the top. So the heart is is red pepper and cedar woods. And that's, or sorry, the heart is red pepper. The base is cedar wood. And so if you know Anique Minardo's style, you'll kind of have an idea of what to expect here. I've heard some other reviewers mention that this smells like David o Davidoff's hot water. Uh, other than the bottle being the same, um, you know, I've never smelled hot water, so I can't uh, can't comment on that. I've never smelled Davidoff's hot water, but uh, the, com the, the bottles are very similar. So um, let's spray Zarius Rouge. Oh, man, my room is just going to smell amazing when we're done with all this. Oh, yeah. You know what this just reminded me of in the air? Also a 90s fragrance. Uh, and I know I'm just jumping around, but uh, sometimes that's how I like to talk. And sorry, I took my nice pants off and put the sweatpants on when I got home. So you guys are going to have to put up with sweatpants. But if you've ever smelled this little bad boy, this is Jacques Fat Pour L'Homme. Very underrated. Jeremy Fragrance actually hyped this up, believe it or not. He's hyped up a couple good ones, and this is one of them. Um, there's a little bit of this Jacques Fat Pour L'Homme in, in Zarius Rouge in the air. On skin, though, you definitely get more of this sort of spicy, woody. I see where the synthetic, you know, knock comes on this. I see where this chemical synthetic knock comes on, but... Uh, I, I have no problem with this as far as like, um, you know, uh, as far as a, because there is this freshness, you know, when you cut into a cactus and it has that sort of watery inside, it's a brilliant, um, way of creating a fresh fragrance without doing what everyone else is doing. And that's why I love Anique Minardo. She, um, the great Anique Minardo. She always goes against the grain. She never does what everyone else was doing. She does her own thing. She has her own style. She has her own DNA. Man, good stuff. Zarius Rouge. Okay, now this is a new, newer bottle to my collection. I just got it within the last month or two. Again, thanks to Cullen. And Cullen found me a vintage bottle. So apparently, so the brand new bottles of this don't even have the pie symbol on them. The middle reformulation, if you will, has a big pie symbol on, on the front. And the vintage bottles have a baby pie symbol. And it looks like that. That's what the original bottles look like, a small pie symbol. The, the middle one has it big. The newer one doesn't have it at all. So that there's your, there's your timeline, if you will. But this is an Alberto Morias again. I actually sprayed this one already because I was playing with it earlier. Sprayed it on the wrong side of the card, but I did spray it. It's an oriental... Um, it sort of has this mix of this almondy like benzoin. So there's this almond like benzoin with what they call ironwood. Okay. So ironwood, according to, um, some sources, which I've never smelled ironwood on my own, but apparently ironwood is a very strong sort of, um, wood, right? And sometimes it can have a little bit of an unpleasant smell, but it's got this sort of earthy infusion of notes. So you get little hints of vetiver and birch and violet leaf buds and cardamom and stuff like that, black pepper and tea. Um, and so that's that ironwood note that sort of runs through the runs through the heart of the fragrance. But what's interesting, this came out in 1999. In 1998, there was a fragrance that came out by the house of... Uh, Hermes, and it's called Aroco Bar. And this, interestingly enough, has this um, sort of pine, uh, fir balsam, greenness infused with this, um, I guess, ambery, benzoiny, woody sort of uh, profile. And while this doesn't have the same sort of woody profiles, this is much more focusing on, to me, much more focusing on the benzoin, the resinous quality, that oriental sort of powderiness, if you will. Um, but the pine needles are here. There is this pine needle-like note, if you will, um, that blends in with that ironwood, which I've never really seen used before. Um, apparently, there are other fragrances with an ironwood note. One is actually a flanker of 
of Givenchy's pie, which I've, I've never smelled. Um, but, and it opens up with this mandarin orangey citrusy. So imagine mandarin orange, and you can almost see it in the color of the bottle and the juice, right? So there's this, um, there is this ambery, benzoiny, almondy, uh, probably one of the best, um, probably one of the best benzoin tonka, uh, designer fragrances that I've smelled. Um, definitely could be worse. I'll tell you that definitely could be worse. It came out at the end of the nineties and I was again, thinking about some comparisons and, um, if you've ever smelled this, I think Cristobal Poron by Balenciaga again, which came out a couple years after Givenchy's pie. I think that Gerard Anthony may have taken some notes. You know, I think this was maybe a little bit of an influence on this. I still think I prefer this. Um, but I, but I'm liking what I'm smelling. I'm liking what I'm smelling from, uh, Givenchy's pie for sure. So that is number, where were we? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. That was number five. Okay, number four. Number four is uh, probably one of the staples as far as classic fougeres from the 80s. This is all the way back to 1986. And this is created by Alberto Morias. And it's interesting, if you go back through Alberto Morias's portfolio, in the 80s and early 90s, he made some fragrances that had note listings, you know, like a Roja Dove note listing. It's huge. Tons of notes, tons of complexity. Um, and it's just interesting following his career and seeing how it's sort of morphed into what he is today now, which he just pumps them out now. I mean, I feel like the guy can do a fragrance a week. Um, and But back then, it wasn't like that at all. He took his time with his releases. And this is one of them. And this actually is, I think... Um, as far as just like fresh, spicy, woody, classic fougeres for men, this is in that mold. Many people compare it to things like, um, Enrico Coveri, pour on, which I've talked about on the channel before. Think about that style of a fougere, right? And so this is number four, and this is the original Zarius. So this is a vintage bottle. They have since put it in the same sort of, um, generic... LVMH, you know, mass marketing bottle that you would expect them to, to put it in. But these old bottles, these old Zarius bottles, I think are just almost like a work of art. Look how beautiful they look next to each other. Um, absolutely stunning. And so this is Jasmine, Macy, Langy Lang, Bergamot, Lavender, Lemon, Mandarin Orange, Rose, Violet, and Lily of the Valley with Cypress, which is a very underutilized note, uh, Juniper Berry, Sandalwood, cinnamon, carnation, coriander, petigran, tarragon, cyclamen, and geranium with a base of balsam, spruce, cedar, musk, leather, oak moss, vetiver, amber, and frankincense. Beautiful note, note breakdown and beautiful fragrance. And if you like those classy, you know, gentleman-like fragrances, you're not going to offend anyone with that. However, staying power isn't the best. Even with the vintage, I reapply every five or six hours. It's just my style with these type of fragrances. Um, very elegant, very, um, very classic, if you will. This would never go out of style to me. This is a classic fougere done proper. And um, I don't know what the newer version is like, but I can tell you that the vintage is absolutely worth hunting down. I think this is a hundred and yeah, it's a hundred mil. Yep. And you can sort of see the 87 proof on the bottom right there. So yes, good stuff. Zarius is good stuff. Okay, so that was number four. Number three, top three. Number three is a fragrance that I have hyped and talked about on the channel for a long, long time. Uh, I've shown off the box actually in my um, uh, presentation series. I did an entire series dedicated to the presentations on of the boxes because all of my boxes are in the attic and I just keep the bottle so I can kind of reach back and show a bottle without messing with the box. Uh, but I actually pulled all the boxes down to do this presentation series. So if you want to see the box with the short ingredient list and what it looks like and all that stuff, you can. But this is a vintage bottle of Satis de Givenchy. And this is coming in at number three, believe it or not. Uh, and the reason that this is number three to me, and the reason it beat out things like Givenchy three, which I know I went on and on about how great it is and um, 
Oh, I'm getting more of the castorium now. Wow, absolutely deservedly so. Uh, but the reason that this beats it out is that I think that, so first of all, this is a Dominique Ropion, okay? And it came out in 1984. And this came out one year before things like uh, Dior's Poison, let's say. And I think you could easily make a case that this was the influence for what many people consider one of the most iconic women's fragrances of the 80s is in Dior's Poison. Um, and again, the note listing is an opera in and of itself. It's almost like being at a buffet or a banquet. A buffet is not the right word. A banquet. You know, a royal banquet is what this is like. And you're just constantly being served like a 20-course meal. And everything just keeps coming to you. Uh, the opening is aldehydic with orange blossom, galbanum. So there's a little bit of that green holdover from the 70s with neroli, Brazilian rosewood, bergamot, citrus notes, mandarin orange, and coconut. And this time it's actual coconut. It's not a mistranslation. There is this fruity, fresh, you know, the orange blossom and the coconut sort of play off each other with a heart of jasmine, narcissus, tuberose, ylang ylang, Egyptian rose, Florentine iris, and honey. It is... Imagine the florals are like dripping, you know, with honeyed resin. Imagine you infused all of the florals with honey and they're just like dripping on your skin when you apply this fragrance. There is this, there is this grandness, this opulence to the fragrance. And um, a base of civet, amber, castorium, clove, musk, oak moss, patchouli, sandalwood, vanilla, bay rum. So there's a little bit of um, booziness and vetiver. Now, I have to look for the bay rum sometimes, but they say it's there. But if you like stuff like um, poison, if you like, um, you know, big fragrances, like for example, Carizia's Tietro alla Scala is an example um, of just how big and bold and loud. And um, I love these type of fragrances. I mean, as a frag head, this is the type of perfumery that I wish came back into style. And again, the ingredients, the quality of the ingredients is out of this world. Um, easily, I think this could, you could make a case for one of the best floral Shepras of all time. Um, you know, I don't know what the new version is like. I've heard someone say it's shite, but I've never tried it myself, so I can't speak to that. But if you can get one of these vintage bottles, go for it. I, I, I can easily recommend this, uh, easily. And it's a Dominique Ropion. I mean, people spend over $1,000 to get some of his work for Frederick Mall. And I think I got this from Anouge for under 100 bucks, or 100 or something. I don't think it was very much. Um, now, I'm sure the prices have gone up in the last couple years. But um, this is definitely worth being put on, on the radar. And I absolutely love the bottle, just to top it off. I mean, I love the little cut diamond like cut gem like cut at the top mm, delicious unbelievable uh okay top two so number two this this is the surprise this might be the surprise for some people that this is this high but there's no doubt in my mind there's absolutely no doubt in my mind this deserves to be here and so number two and again this is a new um this is a new entry into my collection within the last couple months I've worn it to bed a few times, and I am in love with this stuff. Actually, I think this is one of the best citrusy Shepra styles, if you want to call it that. Um, this sort of citrus style fragrance uh, in my collection. I think this might be my new favorite. This is Monsieur de Givenchy Haut Concentration. Okay, so this Haut Concentration thing was a very popular thing around this time. And YSL did it, for example. So they took the original YSL Pour Homme. I had to decant some of this. Uh, long story, I'll tell you guys sometime. But they took the original YSL Pour Homme. And they, and they turned it in... This came out in 1971. And they, in 1983, they came out with YSL Pour Homme Haut Concentration. Now... This one was a little bit of a letdown. Uh, I am not as in love. Actually, I think I prefer the original YSL Pour Homme, to be honest with you, um, over the Haut Concentration version. It's supposed to be more of a mossier, heavier, dirtier version, if you will. But 
there is something about this that I put this at number um, seven, right? Eight, excuse me, number eight. Um, and there's a reason that this is number eight and this is number two. Uh, and to me, this takes exactly what I don't care for as much about the original and completely fixes it. The opening lemon bit just hits you like a, you know, the opening bit with the lemon and the carnation, just imagine like police, like opening the door with that, with that, um, you know, with, with that, uh, with that piece of wood that they use kind of together to bust open the door. If they're doing like a search warrant. It just, it opens up so perfectly dirtier. I think they've added maybe a little bit more cinnamon, so it adds some more heft to it. It still has the lemon vervain, lavender, oak moss, musk, sandalwood, constant, you know, pyramid. There's almost no difference according to um, Parfumo in the note listing. But what's different, what's different is how it wears. It wears exactly how I want this type of fragrance to wear. It's ha it still keeps its bold character. This feels almost meek. Like the word, and look at the color of the juice too. You can almost see from the color of the juice. If you take a look, look how light this is and look how much darker this is. Um, that's a great representation of the differences in the scent. And, you know, this, the original seems meek. This takes this style, which I'm not the biggest fan of, and it just adds this character. You know, it adds this, um, it adds this element of swagger to it. It's so good. Uh, it is absolutely so good. One of the best fragrances in this style that I've ever come across. Um, this tops y the YSL, Haute Concentration. Um, there's, you know, Eau Sauvage by Dior has like extreme versions and all this stuff I've never smelled. Um, you know, Chanel's Pour Monsieur has an Eau de Parfum and an Eau de, and an Eau de Toilette Concentrate. I would take this over, over, um, over the... Chanel. Um, and so it is just, you know, it's, I think it's, it's exactly what it says on the tin. It is Hout concentration and it is done very, very well. And I am stoked that Cullen was able to find this. This is a little bit of a rare beast to, to find, but put it on the unicorn list. If you like this style of fragrance, trust the Ram. This will not let you down. Okay. So enough ooing and awing about, uh, Monsieur de Givenchy Haute Concentration at number two. At number one, if you don't know what's number one, you don't know me. You're probably new to the channel. You're probably just getting to know my taste because I have raved and shouted from the rooftops and, you know, beat my chest and just at, on the channel for the better part of a year and a half that this, this made number one on my patchouli list. I did a top 22 for you know, to close out 2022 countdown of my favorite patchoulis, this was number one. And this is now number one on my favorite Givenchy's. Uh, I adore this stuff. It is it is my style 100%. If I had a style, this would be it. It would be stuff like this or Boss Number One. Oh my God. Um, this is um, the original Givenchy Gentleman from 1974. So, my brother Joy, when he did his top Givenchy list, this made like number nine, I think, or eight. This is number one for me. This is the, um, this is what perfume was all about. And if you can see, I got myself a backup. Thanks to my good friend Armando for securing the backup of Givenchy Gentleman. I feel much more secure having two bottles of this. I never want to be without this stuff. I mean, it is honeyed patchouli dream with this leathery, ambery, castorium-like dry down that, um, oh, it's earthy, it's honey, it's animalic, it's leathery. The patchouli in here is one of the best patchoulis I think ever done. I mean, I don't know how you can improve on this patchouli for me. Um, it has little hints of this very sophisticated orris root. So even though it's animalic and earthy and challenging and green and dank and dark and damp and um, spicy in that honey, there's an animalic honey facet to this. It's not a clean, you know, honey. This is a dirty honey that would be picked up by 
fragrance houses in the 80s and turned into things like uh, Hugo Boss Number no. 1 from 85 or Tenere by Paco Rabanne from 87. That animalic honey was kind of picked up and um, they ran with it in the 80s, but it was done here to perfection in 74. And there are some fragrances that tried to copy what Givenchy Gentleman did in 74. Uh, jo um, Jovan had a fragrance called Sex Appeal for Men, which came out a year or two after this, which was like a drugstore version of this scent, spices and patchouli and stuff like that. But this is the OG and um, it is still being marketed today. I don't know what the new stuff is like because I just go for the vintage when it comes to stuff like this. Um, but yes, this is, uh, this is all man. This is what a man should smell like to me. This is what a man should smell like. Not the powder puff, sweet, hazelnut, um, you know, caramel stuff that they're putting out today for men. Not this um, blue fragrance trend that everyone I smell wearing perfume at the office, they're wearing, you know, Sauvage by Dior, or they're wearing Blue de Chanel, Bleu de Chanel. Uh, this is what I want to smell on. This is what I would love to smell on my fellow co-workers. Um, so yes, Blast from the Past, if you know my taste, this is no surprise. Uh, the, the greatest patchouli scent of all time, in my opinion. So, that is my top 10 Givenchy countdown. It feels damn good to be back in the saddle. I missed you guys. I missed doing these videos. Thank you so much to everyone who watches, comments, likes, subscribe, all the stuff I'm supposed to say as a YouTuber. If you um, enjoy this type of content, do leave a like. Uh, you know, someone left me a, and sent me an email and they were like, you put out so much content. Just let us take some of your content and create these little 30 second clips so you'll get more views. And I was like, no, it's not my thing. If that's what you want, I'm probably not for you. You know, I want someone that is so dedicated to getting to learn about perfume history. They're willing to watch a half an hour or an hour video. Put it on two times speed. Let it go, you know. Um, put it on two times speed and let it go fast. It'll, it'll be done in half the time. And, um, but yes, I mean, that, uh, it's, it's, it, they're right though. One thing I will say is I have put out a ton of content and if you are new to the channel, I will urge you to go back, go through my playlist, check out some of the, this is not a top 10, my perfumers portfolio videos, my family portraits. This is going to go in the family portrait playlist. I've done family portraits on Amouage, Roja, Creed, Hermes, Bortnikoff, Frederick Mall, YSL, Dior, Guerlain. So they're great ways to hear about a lot of fragrances all, all in one little condensed video. So Thanks everyone again. I'm so excited to be back. Cannot wait for Friday. Can't wait for Friday for um, uh, Aris Ladore's History of Oud collection to arrive. Live stream coming then, whenever that happens. But, um, but yes, thanks everybody. Cheers, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.